All right, thanks everyone for coming out. Uh, my name is Tim Apnell. I'm a senior product manager with uh, Red Hat. I work on the Ansible team and I have a long history with Ansible. I've actually was a, an early user and contributor going back to, I think it was like version 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Uh, was later a customer of Ansible's when they became a customer. Uh, or, I'm sorry, when they became a company and uh, joined Ansible at some point then joined Red Hat when that came along, and I guess now I work for IBM, but not really. Uh, so it's, uh, I've, I've seen it from all sides. So today uh, I'm gonna talk about something that I've been working on as the product evangelist for Ansible, and it's been talking a lot about how you can use Ansible and Kubernetes together. And more specifically, uh, this thing called the uh, Operator SDK, which makes it easier to deploy and manage Kubernetes applications, which is what operators are for, but to do it in a Kubernetes native way. So this will make a lot more sense, hopefully, by the time I get done presenting this. Uh, but that's what we're here to talk about, what I'm going to be talking about specifically. All right, so just to set some context, Kubernetes, uh, when, when it comes to Kubernetes, you get a lot of powerful functionality uh, right out of the box for managing and scaling applications uh, and you know, just does a, just does a lot of really great things. The problem mm -hmm. is that it's geared towards simple applications, applications that it's well known how you can scale those, how you can manage their life cycle. So what gets difficult is when you're dealing with applications that are stateful. That becomes hard. That becomes more specific than a simple application where. You know, if, if, if it dies, I can just replace it and I can reroute traffic to another one just like it. Uh, you know, so when we get into stateful applications, we're now talking about a whole other level and things get much harder to do, uh, much harder to achieve. So this is where operators came in. How many people here are familiar with operators? Okay. I was hoping that would be the case here. Uh, I normally end up speaking in front of a lot of non-Kubernetes. Uh, groups, a lot of Ansible people that are that I, I need to often explain even what Kubernetes is. So I, this is going to make fitting this into half an hour a whole lot easier now for me. Uh, so just to recap, uh, operators are a way to simplify the management, the life cycle of, of complex Kubernetes applications. Uh, you know, it's encoding the human knowledge uh, that goes into to operating these systems or, or in maintaining these systems in a Kubernetes native way. So all the patching, upgrading, installing, whatever it is that it takes to manage that complex application, that sophisticated application from day one, day two, through its, you know, its entire life cycle. So with operators, uh, you don't have to be reactive in watching these applications and when something happens, get an alert and have to take some type of corrective action yourself. You can allow the operator to do this to pick it up within seconds right on the cluster and automate that management. Now that's operators in general and there's a lot of different ways that you can use the operator pattern and develop the operator pattern. Some of the brilliant engineers at Red Hat came up with this idea of couldn't we use Ansible? I mean Ansible is an automation tool for traditional IT. Could we start to apply this to what happens in Kubernetes on the cluster. And that's what brought about uh, the Ansible uh, Operator SDK. This is actually part of the Operator SDK itself. This is a native part of it. This is not uh, a special plugin or some added thing you have to bring in. If you're using the Operator SDK, you have the ability to develop uh, operators using Ansible. So uh, moving right along, why would you want to do this? Well, typically, a Ansible operator is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not an Ansible operator, an operator in general is written in Go. Uh, sometimes it's also people can use Helm, there's any number of languages, but most of them that are out there are written in Go. Uh, this is great and it's uh, done really well for people that understand Go and know the internals of Kubernetes and, and how to use the API correctly and not blow their foot off. The problem is that the majority of users out there don't have that expertise, so then this becomes a barrier to entry, the, the ability to do things uh, uh, with operators itself. So this is what hatched the idea of the Ansible Operator uh, SDK. Uh, and the idea being that the advantages of, the, of this approach and using Ansible is that it allows you to use your existing skills, the existing Ansible ecosystem that, that we have 
you know, countless numbers of users out there uh, that already are using Ansible for traditional IT uh, automation tasks for many years. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of support, a lot of documentation, a lot of knowledge already how to automate with Ansible. It also lowers that barrier of entry. It brings all the type of, of, of the philosophy that's behind Ansible allowing you to do, simple, uh, do powerful things simply uh, where you do not need programming, uh, programming skills so people like operators can get in, involved or security experts. It do, you don't have to be a developer who knows how to code, who knows how to uh, code Go in this case. So it allows you to iterate faster to maintain these operators uh, uh, in a more reasonable way uh, with a larger base of people. And uh, it also brings some other advantages that, uh, you know, this is um, getting into my uh, lightning talk later today, is they, they're, Kate's and Ansible are very similar in that they're both declarative state engines and they both heavily rely on YAML. So there's a lot of similarities that, so that the two can really work together quite seamlessly. Uh, another advantage that Ansible brings is that it has a built-in templating engine. So instead of working with static YAML files, you can now templatize what you're doing and automate, um, uh, you know, these, take these inputs and, and send them out as resources there. So it brings a lot of, a lot of, a lot of goodness, a lot of abstraction layers that makes uh, people's lives easier and also allows more people to participate in automating this stuff and developing this stuff. So this is uh, roughly what an operator uh, using Ansible would look like. It's very, if you're familiar with the operator pattern, you'd see it's the standard, uh, you're working with the API, you're working with a custom resource to manage your application state or your services state. Um, at that point in the middle is where it's somewhat unique. What you get in an operator using Ansible is that there's this binary this, that's been pre-written for you. It's more or less a generic operator written in Golang that works as a, a, a proxy in the informer, does a whole lot of the, the, the low-level plumbing work that you have to do in, if you wrote an operator from scratch. It's already built in there. And then it knows that when it starts up to read something called the watch file. And what the watch file does is it maps events inside of Kubernetes to a role or a playbook, an Ansible role or playbook. So you have this uh, you know, role and playbook that you are creating and then you're mapping it to events that are gonna happen inside of Kubernetes and you build it, send it out. And that's, this is a more detailed view of what I just explained there, it might uh, help understand it. So what happens is, is when that operator um, starts up, the, the binary runs, reads in the watches file and says, okay, what am I looking at? Great, now I'm gonna start watching. When an event happens, uh, it, so it starts monitoring that event. When that event happens, it then uh, looks up, what do I need to execute? It runs Ansible through the Ansible runner, takes back what's coming from there, puts that in the status of the custom resource so that you know what was the, the last run what happened here. It's doing things like rever uh, it has a reverse proxy in there so that it does caching of the API for you. It does owner references for you automatically so you don't have to worry about that and you have proper garbage collection happening. Whole bunch of other nice things like that that's happening inside of that binary that, again, it's, it's a nice abstraction layer so you don't have to think about this kind of common redundant uh, things that you normally would if you wrote an operator from scratch uh, and then, well, like I said, it automatically ups the, updates the uh, resource status and uh, makes the API calls necessary to manage your uh, application or your service through the API. So that's a diagram of what's happening inside of an operator that's using Ansible. This is something I always like to point out and about the value of what you get for free when you use Ansible for developing your, uh, your operators is you as a developer or maybe one of your colleagues that are maybe maybe they're more junior or maybe they're not really a programmer whatever their case might be there you're only charged with what's in that white box that's all you have to focus on and that's all you need to worry about developing and that's defining the watch file and writing some ansible automation we have a particularly a um a kate's module it's k8s uh, that's that's pretty much just like uh, cube control. So if you know how to do stuff in cube control, you already know how to use this module. And so anything you could do with cube control, you could uh, put into your automation, plus the other 3,000 modules that 
uh, come with Ansible. So you're writing your automation, you're doing your watches file, and that's all you have to do. Everything you see down here in the gray box gets bundled and packaged for you by the operator SDK, and you don't have to worry about it at all. That's something that, that you or, like I said, uh, uh, one of your colleagues doesn't have to think about. It's that, that uh, operator SDK binary, it's Ansible, the Python libraries, Ansible runner, all those things you need are, are part of the build process. Uh, this is another thing I like to highlight too. Uh, one, one of the things I get, I've been speaking about this a lot, is someone says, uh, one, one very blunt person said to me, well, well surely Ansible's a toy uh, and I couldn't write uh, a, a full operator in it. And what we're finding is that that's really not the case at all. You can do and automate the entire life cycle of an operator using Ansible as you could with Go. The thing with Go is that you get finer level control and there are going to be those edge cases where yes, you do need to use Go. But for the most part, we're finding that the majority of use cases that users need to do, we're covering. And, and the ones that we're digging up, we have plans to address. Uh, another option available to you with uh, the operator SDK is you can use Helm, but you're limited to these first two phases uh, that you can only do install and some basic upgrades and patches. Uh, we've We've been hearing from some other ISVs that have written operators uh, using Helm because that was the Helm chart that they had available to them, uh, or that they had Helm charts already available, uh, are now running into limitations. They want to do things that Helm isn't made to do, and now they're looking at, well, what, what else can I use? And, and they're considering using Ansible now uh, for their operators. So. If at any point anyone has any questions, I don't mind being interrupted on this, by the way. I should have said that up front. Uh, I mean, this is being recorded and my slides will be out also. Uh, okay, with that. Uh, so the, the steps for developing are, are pretty straightforward. Uh, what you need to do is you use the operator SDK, you do a new and uh, give it a few parameters. The key thing is, is you put what I have down there in red, type equals Ansible. What this will do is it will build out an entire skeleton project for you. Uh, to write an operator using Ansible. And it fills in a lot of the, all the, you know, it not only just creates the directory structure, but it fills out a lot of the files for you and gives you a, a starting point. It even goes so far as to write tests in Molecule. Molecule is a testing framework for Ansible. This will actually generate some basic tests for you to start using to uh, unit test your operator itself. So once you have that, uh, you then, like I, like I said before, you write your automation inside of Ansible, uh, you know, a playbook, a role, whatever, whatever it takes, how, whatever your style of development is, uh, and then define the watches file. In a lot of cases, in the basics at least, the new step will have created a watch file for you that you don't even need to touch. Um, sometimes you do if you're trying to do some more sophisticated things or some uh, other uh, switches and knobs you can you can pull inside the watch file that you may need to add, but a lot of times I find I don't even have to touch the watches file, uh, nonetheless. Uh, and then once you, you once you're ready, you do a build, and that's a, actually a really shallow command to be honest with you. If you, you could take it apart and figure out how to do it yourself, but it's there for a convenience. And what it does is it packages all those things I showed you in the previous slide: the the, the binary, all the Python libraries, Ansible libraries things and, and the automation that you wrote and puts it into one operator, at, uh, um, or I should say one container that you can now ship out and use on any cluster. And that's a key thing that when, it, because I'm from Red Hat and I show this, a lot of people say to me, oh, well, surely this is only for OpenShift, right? I'm like, no, it's actually any, any Kubernetes installation that you can use this stuff on. Once you have that um, operator, in this case, the foo operator, you can deploy it on any Kubernetes. And in fact, I'm going to attempt the live demo here. I'm just running Minikube on my uh, Mac, and um, it's not a problem at all. So at that point, you can just push it out to any um, uh, registry out there and uh, have at it or share it with others on the, on the operator hub. Um, all right, so I got to the demo sooner than I thought I would. Uh, give me one second. So I'm going to do a couple of things. Let me see here if we can. All right, can everyone still hear me if I'm, I know I was getting too close, too far, it's always. Yeah, definitely need to make that a lot 
bigger. Okay, so the first thing I thought I'd do is to show you what you get when you use the operator SDK to set up your package and what, what goes into a project um, um, using Ansible like this. So uh, I hate to type, so let me just go back into my history here. There we go. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to run the operator SDK, the new command, um, naming my operator null operator because it's not going to do anything. Um, and hand the API version I want to use. It's going to be kind null. And there's that type equals Ansible. So that's a key thing. So ran that, boom, kicks out a whole bunch of status messages. And now I have here in my projects directory this, um, I have this uh, null operator project. And I see I get a few directories out of build directory, deploy directory, molecule, which is that test, the tests um, for my operator. Uh, uh, a roll and a watches file. So let's take a look inside of each of those really quickly. So in the build, it, it generated a Docker file for me. I also created a Docker file for doing my testing and a little shell script that's there as a utility. Um, deploy gives you a whole bunch of manifest files that you can use with cube control to uh, deploy your operator um, and, and set it up out there. So it's all very boilerplate type of stuff just to help you get started and give you a, a basis for, um, for, for getting your work done. Um, I'm going to skip over molecule. Uh, should have asked this question for how many people are familiar with Ansible and use Ansible? Okay, good. Wow. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so then you're very familiar with this directory structure here. It's just a role named null and it's already created a lot of the YAML file for or at least stubs form so that it just helps setting up, uh, writing my role to uh, uh, auto automate whatever Kubernetes application I'm looking to use. And then I will show you, here's the watches file. So this is, like I said, this maps the Kubernetes uh, uh, events in this case, you know, well, well, not in this case, but it's version group and kind. That, that's, that's how it's keying on what, you're, what it should be watching. And then in this case, it created a, a role and it has a path to where that role is so that, that uh, it knows where to find and what, what to run when that particular event happens or, or a change in the state happens on that uh, particular resource is what I should actually have been saying. You can have many of these in your account or, or in your watches file. I've, I've seen ones where it's watching multiple resources and then there, there's uh, um, automation for all of those in one or you could do it piecemeal, you know, just uh, one resource, one operator, and it could be just as simple as just a, a playbook instead of a full role. It's all up to what you prefer. I like to do everything in roles. Um, that's just my style, but you, you have options is what I'm trying to say here. All right. So any questions on that? No? Okay. So how am I doing? Okay, so we'll have plenty of times for, for more questions. Uh, I'm going to move on to something else a little more interesting to show you this running. Um, so what we have here is, um, I should have had a slide in here for a diagram of this. This is something that uh, one of our people developed. So uh, there's this tool out there called McRouter. Most people haven't ever heard of it. And the MC is actually for memcached. So this is something that Facebook created and open sourced out there that they use themselves. Uh, Memcache, I know, has been around a very long time, almost probably 20 years. I can remember being on the early mailing list and some people showing up there and saying, yeah, I'm with this new startup called Facebook and we got 20 of these uh, Memcache nodes. And was, I think they've come a long way since then. Uh, but uh, what, McRouter is a smart Memcache router that sits in front of, of a pool of Memcache nodes and then um, routes traffic accordingly. So these are all things that memcache traditionally couldn't do. So the memcache router has to know, well, what is in my pool? Uh, what type of strategy am I using? What switches am I pulling to manage these pool of relatively dumb caching nodes, memcache nodes that are out there? So they require coordination. So if you're going to run them in a, on a Kubernetes cluster, the McRouter needs to know what's in its pool. And that's what the operator uh, is doing here. And like I said, I, I, 
I, I was trying to cut this down because I had to fit in 30 minutes and I'm realizing I cut one too many slides. I should really have one up here of this, uh, what this does. So, the, so McRouter sitting in the front knows what's in its pool, how to handle each of these nodes in the pool so that if there's a scaling event, for example, a pot, you know, you, you need more memcache nodes, McRouter gets reconfigured to know, hey, I have two or I have four new nodes to work with in its pool. And that happens automatically through a single API, through a single interface. Uh, and that's uh, what I can show you here um, in this demo. All right. So, do, 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 do. so the first thing I'm going to do, well, what I should do is show you, I have nothing up my sleeves like any good magician. Not that this is so magical, but. So I'm running just uh, Minikube on my MacBook locally. Uh, ran Cube Control, we just have the, the, the Kubernetes service running there, no big deal. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, as a shortcut, we uh, merged all those files that you saw earlier into one big, um, into one file to set up everything. So I wouldn't have to type all these cube control applies to each of those individual files that it had generated. So I'm gonna run that, created a custom resource definition, role, role binding, service account and deployment for my operator. So if I go in there now, um, well, All right, so now we have the operator. It has been deployed, but hey, where's my application? Well, that's because we haven't created the, um, the custom resource itself. It's watching for that custom resource, but we haven't created any. We've set up the definition, we've set up the operator. It's all out there. Now we need to uh, deploy something. So I'm going to Give it a second, sometimes it is a little bit slow. One of the controls that you can put in the watches file is how fast the reconciliation loop is checked. So I think it's a, by default 30 seconds, you can shorten it if you're impatient. All right, so there we see that, um, oh and I forgot to do something here. Um, so okay, let me, let me go back to, let me go back to this and I'll show you the log files. I should, have, I should have had the log files running so you could see the activity of what, what was happening when I just ran that. Uh, so we see now that just by creating that one custom resource, and I should have showed you that file too, which I can still do. So just by using this one file here, I was able to feed it in a bunch of different um, parameters and have this entire dynamic caching service set up. And one of the things that I had up there was memcache pool of two. And if we go back to um, look at cube control here, we see that we have two memcache nodes there. Now, before I make a change here and show you how through that one API endpoint, uh, I can talk I can let the operator do its thing. Um, actually, uh, I heard a really good description. I don't know if everyone saw Ryan filling in for Josh earlier today. I really loved his description of, of that, you know, it's not turning left and turning right. It's saying, hey, I want to go home and then let it figure things out. I thought that was a really great analogy for the way operators work that I'm going to steal now um, in all my talks going forward. All right. Um, all right, now I remember what I was doing. What happened to my, oh, I see. That's annoying, okay. Um, so, all right. So what I do is I, I pulled up the uh, logs of the uh, Ansible container that's running inside of the operator itself. And you see it's, it's pretty much the standard uh, 
output that you get from an Ansible playbook, but this will help you debug what's happening and also see what's happening in the operator itself. There are controls to how much verbosity you get. So if you, you're in debugging mode, you can turn it up to see uh, what, what's happening in there. You can turn it down if it's too much noise for you. Okay, so what I wanted to show, one last thing and then take any questions you might have is, uh, you know, this, this could have been done a lot more elegant way, but I will uh, just do it, just sort of hack through it. I'm, so I'm going, let's say, uh, you know, I'm Disney Plus and I'm like, whoa, we're getting more subscribers than I thought. We need to scale up. Not that only two to five is... Not the two to five is really anything they had to deal with, which I think they did a phenomenal job for all the hiccups that they had or, or the, the fact that they, they didn't pull a True Detective season one finale is just, I, I think, kudos to them. I was hoping they would show up so I could shake their hand, but it didn't happen. What's it? Yes, yeah. Um, okay, so all I do is I, I change that there. Like I said, there could have been more elegant ways to do this, but... Um, I'm just going to go with the simplest thing. Um, oh. Why do I keep doing that? Okay, so I run that. We had a change in the configuration. All I do is I change that one number and. Um, We now see that the operator saw that change in state and worked to uh, scale things up and reconfigure the MIC router to know that it now has five nodes to work with in its um, um, in its in its pool there. So, oop, I'm in the wrong window. So, do you have any uh, questions? Yes. Uh, yes, they're passed through as environment as extra bars. So, so that that binary that that manages running Ansible itself takes all the um, all the inputs from the spec and then some and passes them into the playbook itself as extra bars. And that's something in the docs that it'll explain all the different bars that you'll see get passed in and have at your disposal inside of the playbook. Is there any kind of validation by default? I missed some value which is doesn't have any default. Not by default. That's though something that we were just talking about um, that we need to build in. It'd be a really great thing to add. I mean, you can write assert commands right at the beginning of your um, right at the beginning of your playbook and make those checks yourself. But we need to make that easier. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Well, since no one else is asking. <laughs> More. Uh, I still think I got one more minute. This is the inside of the playbook, uh, or the role, I should say, the tasks that are run here. And we're seeing we're using the Kate's module uh, three times, and we're using the uh, function to read a template. So in this case, we decided, hey, it would be a lot easier if we could manage these files independently than embedding them inside of our playbook itself. So we're using this uh, lookup template function that reads in uh, the, the, the template and merges the variables that have been fed in from the operator, from whatever source that we have, uh, and to then feed that into the Kate's API as the definition itself. And I'll just give you a quick look before I get off the stage here, or proverbial stage. Uh, let's see, McRouter deployment. Okay. Just going to show you what one of these... Um, templates look like. So here we see, so like meta name, meta namespace, these are things that are being fed into you um, by, by, by Kubernetes itself that then you can work into your templates or whatever automation you're doing. And if you go down here further towards the bottom, I, uh, yeah, you should all be able to see it. Uh, you can do things uh, in here like, like conditionals to say, well, if uh, someone has the choice of saying run in sharded mode or run in uh, replicated mode and then to adjust its configuration string according to that whatever's been fed into the spec itself. 
So this is, this is like the power of, of being able to templatize stuff inside of Ansible in addition to all the other things that Ansible can do outside of the uh, Kubernetes world that can be applied internally. So with that, I am out of time, but I'm going to be around for any questions. Uh, feel free. Um, I got some community swag up here if you want, the, the operable. Um, yeah, so thank you for listening. Thanks.